Well, I want to welcome you to ADR Online. And uh, we have not taught ADR Online before. Uh, it, it is somewhat of an of a interactive class, typically. But in fact, this is a survey course. And I actually think that you can get a lot from this uh, basically with the exercises that we're going to be doing this semester, uh, although it is obviously an abbreviated semester. I want to just go through a couple uh, things with you, uh, just some basics. Uh, obviously, hopefully by now, I know there were some problems with this with uh, people not being able to get the textbooks uh, real quickly. Um, this is the textbook, Resolving Disputes, third edition by uh, Walters, uh, and that the author is uh, Fulberg at Tal, and it's an excellent book, and it, it basically provides a lot of the foundation that we need to successfully implement ADR in our daily lives. Uh, but what I'm not going to do is regurgitate what you read in the readings, uh, but basically put the, the concepts into a more real-world uh, realistic, user-friendly type of thought uh, checklist uh, for a lot of things. Um, this is a, a new book that we're using. It's more like a traditional textbook, and sometimes I think it's easy to get lost in the volume of words and forget about the basic theory of what ADR is really all about. And that's the thing that I'm going to talk to you about over and over and over again about the value of ADR in your daily life as a lawyer, and more importantly, just as a person in, in essentially all your transactions, whether you're buying a car, buying a house, uh, wanting to get married, whatever it is, it, the, the skills that you can learn here can serve you really well through the entirety of your life. So I want to talk a little bit about what ADR is and what it is not. So we know that in law schools all around the country uh, and on TV, you always hear about trials, right? Uh, that's the big thing for a lawyer is handling a jury trial or a bench trial or a big case. And you see all the media hoopla like the O.J. Simpson case, like the Casey Anthony case, and all these cases where uh, it creates tons and tons of drama day in and day out. Um, the reality is, is that of all cases filed in the country, about a maximum of no more than 3%, 3% of those cases actually go to trial. So that means that 97% of the cases you'll work on through your professional life will need to be handled through some sort of an alternative dispute resolution theory. Now, with that said, that seems to say to me that one theme that I, I really am going to emphasize, and, and before I get to that, let me suggest too that you take good notes. And I'm going to tell you when I'm emphasizing certain things because I mean, you might think, maybe you might see that on an exam or a quiz or something like that. So uh, please take notes about some of these things because the, the process of actually taking notes, and it seems like fewer and fewer students actually have the ability to write things down anymore, and I don't know why, I guess because everybody records it or just listens to it. The act of writing these things down will actually help you solidify it in your mind and make you much more successful on quizzes and, more importantly, in your life when you're using these tools. Because all the things we're going to talk about are simply tools that you will carry on your tool belt or in your toolbox as an attorney, regardless of the type of law that you practice. Frankly, the things that we're talking about now will make you, if you put them into practice and use them and continue to develop your skills over time, these things will help you whether you're in a, a transactional attorney, whether you're a, a lobbyist, whether you're a trial attorney, a family law attorney, whatever kind of, of work you do, 
even if you're not, even if you never take the bar and you just use your law license for business purposes, I can't emphasize to you enough how the skills that we'll talk about will really help to make it make you very successful in any endeavor. Uh, so, uh, when you look at this number of 97 percent, it, it seems to me to make sense that if that's true, then this should be something, when I say this, meaning ADR and the subsets of ADR that we'll talk about in the class, that is something that to me suggests you should want to continue to receive training on this for the rest of your life. Uh, whether it's continuing legal education, whether it's programs that you go to or seminars or even better going to uh, you know, actual uh, classes where they really emphasize skill-based learning through doing mediations, arbitrations, and things like that. What I think a lot of people uh, fall back on is that, well, the truth is, I think most of us know intuitively that we've been negotiating since we were old enough to talk, actually, even before that. Um, if, if you wanted uh, something from your parents, you knew early on that you would behave a certain way, you might cry, you might stomp your feet, you might get good grades, uh, you might you know, win something somewhere, a spelling bee or you know, t-ball, whatever it might be. You learned early on that by getting some sort of leverage that you would be able to take that leverage and then negotiate with your parents or parent or whoever and turn that into something that would benefit you. So we all, at an intuitive level, have a very basic, uh, almost uh, animalistic knowledge of some basic inherent issues and uh, workings of negotiation. The problem is, um, and I kind of liken this to swimming uh, or basketball or any sport where you see people that excel in it and then you think about everyone else. So, for example, the uh, Olympic swimmer, Phelps, when you look at him swim, you see someone who does the same basic moves that you would do if you know how to swim when you go into a swimming pool. And that is, you have the crawl, you have the side stroke, the breast stroke, the back stroke. I mean, there's just basic swimming techniques. And if you, if, you, if you watch professional basketball, baseball, any sport, you see people doing the same thing that you did when you were eight, nine, ten years old. What makes the difference between a professional athlete or a gold medalist Olympic athlete and everyone else? What, what is that? Well, the difference is that they've mastered the basics. You know, we always look at things or tend to look at things, especially law students, because you know sometimes law students like to make things more complicated. And so, as law students and lawyers, we tend to look at things in sometimes more of a complicated way, when the reality is that we forget about the very most fundamental and basic things that we need to do to make sure that we get the best result. And that's how professional athletes become who they are. They have mastered the basics at a higher level than anyone else. When uh, Phelps does a, uh, a breaststroke or a backstroke or any stroke, he's not doing a stroke that's different, something you don't know, something extremely complicated that you know, took years and years to develop. It's the same thing. He has just been the best at it. And that is really true with alternative dispute resolution. There's always been this idea that you know ADR is just you know pomp and circumstance and, and it, it really you know uh, I mean anybody can do it right if you if you've graduated law school uh, you you can negotiate a case and that is simply not true although if you want to again analogize it to something like swimming I guess anybody if they know how the very basics can swim and get from point A from the pool to point B that's true. But there's a really big difference in the thing that is most important to every one of us as a lawyer that might ever represent a client, and that is the quality of the outcome. Because what we do is about outcome for the client. And 
one thing that I think we see a lot, I don't think, I know, is that lawyers sometimes think about cases from within their own prism, their own lens, instead of really thinking about what the client needs and what the client wants. So let's look at ADR just fundamentally what it is, right? Well, we know that ADR is basically, it's an umbrella. And underneath that umbrella, we have a number of different types of mechanisms that we can use. And so we have uh, fundamentally our most basic, which is negotiations. Now, sometimes if that uh, breaks down, then we can move on to mediation, which is another form of ADR. Mediation, which I'll repeat many, many times, is very helpful when you have a client, uh, regardless of what side you're on, that is somewhat recalcitrant to your recommendations and suggestions regarding strategy on a case. Now, one thing that uh, law students especially find hard to comprehend, and just for whatever reason they have a really hard time with this, is people hate lawyers. I mean, that is a fundamental fact. Even lawyers' own clients generally have oftentimes a skewed view of that person simply because of this generalized view that people have of attorneys. So, Sometimes if you have a problem with communication or you've tried everything and you cannot get a client to listen to your rationale, to your logic in terms of why you think a case should go a certain way, oftentimes having a mediation where you have a neutral third party that basically helps both sides arrive at a mutually agreeable resolution. That can take a lot of weight off your shoulders if you have someone that's just really not wanting to listen. And sometimes you have cases where on both sides you have recalcitrant clients that are just not interested in what the attorneys have to say. They, for whatever reason, have some belief based on something that, you know, that your recommendations are ridiculous, uh, that there's no reason to move in the direction that you recommend they move in, and it can get complicated. Mediation is an amazing way uh, oftentimes to take that monkey off your back and free you up to allow a third par uh, party that is neutral to speak with your client in a way that might be more persuasive. And there's sometimes dynamics that just makes that true. So another type of ADR is called arbitration. You've probably heard about a lot of litigation recently with the Supreme Court. Uh, there's been some significant rulings by the Supreme Court, which I think were surprising to a lot of people, uh, in regards to arbitration. Arbitration is a means to essentially try your case, sort of like a jury trial, but, or a bench trial more aptly, uh, but you have a lot of benefits for both sides when you do arbitrate a case because you usually can get an arbitration done much more quickly. For a trial uh, or a case that's, that's heading to trial, whether it's a bench or jury trial, uh, you can oftentimes be looking at a minimum of two years before you ever actually get into a courtroom. With arbitration, you can usually get a case resolved a lot of times six months or less. Uh, but regardless, way, way sooner than you ever could in a jury or bench trial. You also have the benefit of expense, or lack thereof, or certainly much more limited when it comes to the process of arbitration. Why is that? Well, for one thing, typically with arbitration, you have defined parameters that you and someone else have agreed to in terms of things like discovery. Uh, it's not unusual in a significant case like a medical malpractice case or a uh, products liability claim, something like that, where there's a potentially a, an incredible amount of damages, that you could have uh, expenses 
just pure hard expenses for experts, for discovery costs, for depositions, and all the things that go along with a trial that had anywhere from $50,000 to $100,000. That's not unheard of, and it can accumulate very, very quickly. So one of the huge benefits to arbitration for both sides is the fact that your expenses will, on, on its face, be dramatically reduced because you know the parameters that you have in terms of what discovery everyone's agreed to do and not to do, and so forth. So it's, it's an excellent, excellent means to expedite a matter to get to a quicker conclusion. Another benefit people don't realize is that arbitrators typically are far, far more uh, learned about a particular area of law. So for example, you may have a judge that is hearing a case on an employment law dispute. That judge may never have tried a case involving employment law, may never actually have had a case in his or her life that actually dealt with employment law. But because that person is a judge in your case, you may have someone with zero experience that's making a decision based on you know, a huge body of law and precedent and material that would be nice to know that you have a seasoned practitioner with a minimum, for example, if you use a, a, a national like a tr American Arbitration Association, the arbitrators there have a minimum of five to 10 years experience in whatever area that you uh, have a dispute in. So, so that's another benefit that people don't realize when you go to trial. If, obviously, if you have a jury, uh, then you have 12 people who you don't know with very different backgrounds, uh, just different experiences that you're asking to make a decision potentially on an area of law that they obviously know nothing about. And even with a judge, that person may know nothing or very little about that area. So you'll always have a very well-trained person that's an arbitrator in a, in a case that you're actually arbitrating. Um, so the other benefit for oftentimes for both sides uh, with arbitration is uh, publicity or lack thereof, privacy, let's just say that. So when you go to an arbitration, uh, if for example you're a physician and you've uh, had a, a, a med mal case filed against you and you don't want to go through all kinds of discovery and, and press and negative press and all kinds of things like that. So one of the parameters for the arbitration might be that uh, it, it is uh, kept confidential and it is limited in terms of uh, what the arbitrator actually can put in the, uh, the order, the award. Uh, so there's ways to make that much more private than you ever could hope to in an actual uh, trial. So arbitration is a huge benefit when you have a case that negotiation is not going to work or has not worked. Mediation, again, for whatever reason, the parties just have not been able to get together and make it work. Uh, arbitration is a, is a phenomenal uh, opportunity to resolve a dispute. Now, arbitration has become rather ubiquitous in that if you, if you have a cell phone, if you have a credit card, if you uh, purchase an automobile, I would uh, say that probably 70 to 90 percent of everything in your life, purchase of a computer, uh, you know, the purchase of items pretty much from anywhere, at somewhere in the fine print of the documents that you sign, whether you're buying a car, whether you're, even in the employment arena, if you're getting a job, uh, arbitration clauses are now ubiquitous and essentially in almost every single item that we purchase, and as I said, even in employment cases. And in employment cases, what basically happens is, if you go to the Acme company, I like to use Acme because of the Roadrunner, but if you go to the Acme company and you apply for a job as a, as a you know, whatever, uh, I don't know, office worker, whatever it might be, anything from a warehouse person to CEO, you will uh, frequently be asked to sign a document that is called a Dispute Resolution Process Agreement, or DRP. And that agreement basically says that if you have any sort of employment-related dispute, so whether it's a sexual harassment claim, a retaliatory discharge claim, uh, whatever, a, you know, a case under a, a FMLA, or whatever issue that you have that is related to your employment, 
the a company will typically have a process that allows for this tripart right here. So they'll start with what they'll say is an informal process to resolve a, a complaint, which is basically what most companies have, whether they have a DRP or not. And that will simply be trying to resolve the dispute with perhaps a supervisor, maybe the supervisor, supervisor, or uh, human resources, whatever the, the policy may say, it will have in there as, as kind of a first base or first level uh, mechanism, an informal process, which you could say is somewhat akin to negotiation. If that doesn't work, then there'll be a process established to allow the parties to enter into a mediation. We're going to talk about this a lot, uh, but when an employer asks you to waive your right to a jury trial contractually, um, obviously the courts are going to scrutinize that agreement because we don't want there to be an uneven playing field where we basically, an employer can extort you to do something that is taking away your constitutional rights uh, simply in order to, you know, have something on paper that looks like it's, it's strong. So the courts have looked at these agreements extremely carefully and what you will find now, not always before, but now you'll find that in most cases when an employer has a, uh, a dispute resolution program or DRP, that the, it is very employee centered. Um, it used to be more employer centered, but now you'll see that the, the 98% of the expenses that are related to mediating and related to arbitration are going to be the, the, born on the employer. So they will have to eat that. Uh, the, they, they'll usually ask the employee for just a token sum just so the employee knows that he or she's in the game. Uh, so we'll talk about that a lot more, but even in those types of arbitration agreements or DRPs for employers, this is the, what they'll have as far as the process. Pretty basic and much more ubiquitous today in terms of employment than it ever was before. Uh, and some of the Supreme Court's recent rulings have, have really, uh, I think, escalated that. So we also have um, a couple other areas that are, are unique uh, and frequently unknown. They're kind of niche areas of ADR that while not known by a lot of practitioners, uh, particularly this next one, which is called collaborative law. Collaborative law is an incredible process and a very unique process that would allow you in a, a particular type of situation where you were in a, a larger metropolitan area like Chicago, Miami, New York, LA, whatever, uh, a larger area where you had disputants that for whatever reason had a very uh, significant need to work together in the future but still had a significant dispute that needed to be resolved through some type of process that was meaningful but really was aimed at maintaining a solid footing in terms of the foundation of that relationship. So as one example that I like to use is Disney. Uh, you know, Disney has had uh, or always had a, an integral relationship with uh, a company, I, I think, I, I, I want to say it's Pixar, but it's a company like that that does a lot of their digital animation. And so if Disney had a dispute with that company, it's a separate company, um, and if they went the regular route of litigation, which would be filing a lawsuit and you know, uh, going through all the discovery process, depositions, trying to annihilate everybody and find out that they're, you know, they all are terrible people, this process of collaborative law would look to really maintain a healthy relationship while still working towards resolving a dispute that has to be resolved in order for the parties to move forward, but is done in a very different way. It's different because the attorneys have to agree contractually that if they're going to go forward with this process of collaborative law, that 
if the parties have a breakdown in terms of their negotiations, the attorneys will recuse themselves. Now, here's the problem. If that's true, and you have clients that have gone through months and months of good faith work in an effort to resolve a significant dispute, it's going to be problematic if the attorneys say, well, I'm sorry, but since we can't get this resolved, you know, we have to get out. Now you're going to have to have a new attorney come in and start from scratch, reading all of the materials and all, you know, start, basically start completely over, anew, afresh. So one of the other aspects of collaborative law, obviously, is that you have to have clients that have the means to withstand that happening. So your clients basically have to be very well off, which is why you'll see this kind of niche uh, ADR mechanism used with families that may have a divorce occurring where both uh, of the family members uh, are you know, very high income people, maybe they're both physicians, engineers, business owners, whatever it is. Uh, they have the means to handle a situation where their attorney has to leave after the case is halfway through and then start completely afresh. So, and, and the same thing holds true of experts that are utilized in the process. If the experts come in during the process and the parties decide they cannot move forward in this manner, then the experts also have to recuse themselves. So now you can just imagine what kind of cost uh, and burden, and not to mention all that aside, a huge delay right in the process if that doesn't work. So there's a huge onus on practitioners using collaborative law to identify very carefully who they use it for, and more importantly, who their opponent is. And we're going to talk a lot more about this issue, about who your opponent is, but it is so critical that you understand who your opponent is, and in this particular case, you have to assure yourself that that opponent has very substantial training in this type of law. And why would you think that would be? I mean, you know, this isn't patent work where we have to have scientists or engineers or people with specialized backgrounds to do something, right? But the primary reason that we want to make sure that the other side has a very significant level of training is to weed out people that will say, well, sure, we'll, we'll engage in this process. But number one, don't really understand what it is. Number two, because they don't understand it, they can't convey the information properly to their client. And number three, you have a lot of really upset people on both sides because now you have a client at the end of this that says, well, you should have been more aware of what the other attorney knew or didn't know about this type of law. And what you find is when people do not have an appropriate level of training, uh, you, you can easily fall into a trap where the opponent is not really engaged in a good faith basis for trying to resolve a matter. And it's particularly problematic in collaborative law because the attorneys in those cases basically have direct connections with the parties. So it's a completely different animal than anything else that we're going to talk about, anything else you've probably ever heard about. But also really exciting because there are certainly a number of times, depending on what you, type of law you practice and where, that you might be able to use this. And as I said, it, it's, it is a burgeoning area of ADR, which you, know, you, you don't see that very often in ADR. It's been a fairly static process for quite a bit of time. Uh, but this is something that's kind of exploding. And even, I say large uh, metropolitan areas, but, uh, you know, I mean, you can find this in St. Louis, you can find it in uh, markets and areas with uh, much smaller populations, but you have to have people with the socioeconomic ability to withstand some of the things that can happen if it falls through, falls apart. So, um, the last area in ADR that we're going to talk about is something that uh, always kind of rattles people, and it's called restorative justice. Well, what the heck is restorative justice? Well, it's certainly something that I think a lot of people try to make fun of. They do make fun of it, they don't understand it, and 
a lot of times when people don't understand something, they tend to make fun of it or you know, just dismiss it. Restorative justice basically is the concept that while our current system of justice in, in the criminal system uh, really focuses mostly in regards to the perpetrator on punishment, on retribution, and not to say that there's anything inherently wrong with that concept, except that that concept in the way it is worked in our system today really forgets about a couple things. And the first thing it forgets about is, is that we have a victim who was victimized, who is going to go through a lot of different issues because of the victimization. And we don't really, in the system, take care of the victims. Now, a lot of prosecutors' offices today have designated victim advocates, um, and they have people that will kind of explain the process to the victims, but they don't really communicate with the victims in a way to understand what they're feeling and what they're going through and what impact the crime may have had on them. Now, restorative justice tends to focus on property-related nonviolent crimes, and it tends to focus mostly in the area of juvenile justice. And the reason is, is that we recognize that taking a punitive uh, retribution approach to young people, while it may feel good at the time, is, and I think most people will acknowledge, oftentimes is basically sending them to a, a facility or an instructional institution where they're going to learn to become more adept at whatever issues they had gone in there for in the first place, basically making them better criminals. Now, restorative justice has been utilized in a, in a number of areas around the country and in Canada. And we're going to look at the results of some of the studies that were done in those places, including Chicago here in Illinois. And the results of the studies are absolutely mind-boggling. In fact, the results are so good, it would make you scratch your head as to why every school system and every county within the state would not utilize at least some form of restorative justice. Because after you see the material that we're going to look at and, and, and see the, the research that's been done, it just really doesn't make sense why we don't use it more. I mean, there's reasons why, and we'll talk about those. But it's sad to know that there's something that can make a, a, a very significant difference, that, that, but, it does, but it doesn't because it's not utilized very much at all. And I suspect that you can maybe imagine some of the reasons for that may be um, the appearance of uh, uh, softness by prosecutors. I mean, I don't think too many prosecutors would campaign on the fact that they're going to promote restorative justice for criminals, even if they're juvenile criminals that committed nonviolent property type crimes. Um, that probably wouldn't get a lot of votes. So you have the, the perception of being a hardline individual when you're you know, running for office. Uh, and then you might also think about financial issues in regards to restorative justice because the dollars and cents relating to the housing of criminals is unbelievable. Um, and when you look at the cost for implementing restorative justice programs in a, in a community and you compare it to the cost of housing individual uh, juveniles, th there's not even a remote comparison. So you, you, I suspect you'll be scratching your head as to why we don't do that more often, or you'll just have the opinion either, either way that it should be done universally or not done at all because we need to you know, beat everyone up who does some sort of a, a crime that, like that. So we'll go over that. That's the, the final area of restorative justice that we'll talk about. Um, I, I want to touch base quickly, too, on what, what ADR can do in the big picture and why it means so much and why you have to focus. I'm going to repeat this again, so 
I hope, hopefully you're taking notes, why you have to become an intentional negotiator or an intentional mediator. And I'll explain what I mean by that, but part of that, when you set out to be an intentional anything, whether it's a pilot, whether it's a police officer, a, law, a lawyer, whatever it is that you do or have done, I hope that you've done it in a way where it's been intentional and that you've thought about how you're going to proceed and what you're going to do. But I want to bring up, in, in, in the mid-1970s, there was a crisis in the world uh, between Egypt and Israel. Um, and it was uh, a massive crisis. And there was a lot of concern that uh, we might end up with essentially a third world war as a result of the tension between the two countries. Uh, in 1978, Jimmy Carter, who was president, uh, basically held sort of, it was a hybrid negotiation mediation at Camp David. And he had, uh, as part of that, Anwar Sadat from Egypt and Menachem Begin from Israel. Um, now these two individuals could not have been more polar opposite in terms of their pure, unadulterated hatred for one another. These people, if they could have gone into a cage match, uh, neither one would have come out. They, they, at their core, wanted to see the other destroyed. And I mean, there's no, that's not an exaggeration. So Jimmy Carter realized that he had a, a lot on his plate and the likelihood of, of success in trying to get these two polarized individuals together was probably not very high. Nevertheless, he brought them into Camp David and in the, the early phases of the talks and the discussions, not surprisingly, uh, things got heated and at one point, Anwar Sadat said, I'm done. I'm, he called his helicopter and it was landing and he was ready to leave. And President Carter said, now wait a minute. Look, I understand that you're, how you feel, but this just isn't about you. This is about a much greater situation, a much larger situation that most likely will impact future generations, including your children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. So I'm just asking you to give this a little more time and let's see if we can do something meaningful. So, so he stayed. And President Carter realized that the initial uh, process he was using to try to bring these two polarized individuals together wasn't really working so well. So he basically did something we call sequestering where he, you know, while one slept, he went and talked to the other and, you know, utilized that process to try to understand what some of the interests were on each side. Well, that worked. And although it started off in a pretty rocky way, the end result of, of that extremely tense mediation slash negotiation was that there was an accord reached at Camp David between Anwar Sadat and Menachem Begin. Now that was in 1978. That was one of the most significant uh, examples in history of something that just purely using the principles that we're going to be talking about through the rest of this class literally prevented something as potentially significant as another world war. Um, and interestingly, the accord that was reached back then, while there's certainly unrest, and there always has been unrest, it's, it's never, there's no panacea to the Middle East for sure, but as a result of that accord that was reached because of President Carter's unwavering tenacity and commitment to the process, uh, today we still see some of the main tenets of that accord in place and used by both sides. So it was truly an historic event. There's books written about it, um, and uh, I'm, I'm sure nobody's going to read those, but uh, it, it's certainly, if you don't know about it, it's an extremely interesting process to see how President Carter adapted his ability and really reached inside of himself and talk about thinking outside the box. I mean, he had to basically burn the box down because that box wasn't going to hold any of these, either of these two people. Uh, so that's, I think, uh, kind of, a, of an interesting uh, historical perspective on the true value of the processes that we're going to talk about. 
Now, I'm going to send you a link to a video by a lady named Amy Cuddy. And the, the concept that Amy Cuddy talks about is really about internal messaging and branding and body language. And the way that we communicate to other people is oftentimes the, the very way that we believe or perceive ourselves to be. And sometimes that may be just fine, that may be great. But sometimes it may be very helpful to us to understand who we are and what we're doing and look at ways that we might be able to come outside of ourselves with very simple techniques. So the video link that you're going to watch with Amy Cuddy is extremely interesting because this isn't something that someone just, you know, just sat around one day and thought about this idea. This was based on scientific fact, uh, looking at uh, uh, hormones and you know different things like that, looking at the animal kingdom, all kinds of different, uh, pretty neat things here uh, that can basically help you if you're someone that tends to be very shy, very inward, uh, you know, maybe kind of doesn't like to engage. Uh, I think it'll be really helpful for you to see that and also to think about it in terms of how those processes might help you in uh, a negotiation or a mediation in the future. You know, one thing that uh, you'll find when you graduate law school and, and presumably pass the bar, uh, you'll realize that you're going to run into a very frequent level of uh, intimidation, whether it's, whether it's intentional or unintentional, where as a new student you go to court for a, a motion hearing, uh, maybe it's a motion to dismiss, maybe it's a more substantive summary judgment motion, and you know you walk into court and your opponent stands up and says, well, Your Honor, uh, hey, I, I uh, enjoyed seeing you at the, at the game Saturday, and uh, man, you know, Jimmy Joe looked great, he's really hitting well, and you know, blah, 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 and you, you sit there and go, well, these people know each other like they're related. And that is not uncommon to see that as, you know, with you being new and you're in a situation where you see these people that have a, a very long history together and then you start thinking to yourself, well, now how am I going to get a fair shake on my case? Because, you know, we, here we have someone, they're obviously longtime friends, they know each other, the families know each other, I don't have a clue, I don't have a possible, any possible way of surviving this. Well, that's not true. Um, I think you'll find that, uh, you know, the judges have a soft, typically have a soft spot in their heart for new students. Uh, but one of the things that's really important as a student or as a new attorney is to present yourself in a way that exudes confidence, not arrogance. And we're going to talk a lot about the difference between arrogance and confidence. We're going to talk about the difference between zealous and zealot. Uh, but for you in a situation like that, especially as new attorneys, whether you're male, female, whatever it is, uh, your ability to be confident about your case, to be knowledgeable about your case and fully prepared, will nine out of ten times win the day. Uh, and that's just a matter of fact. Now, if you walk into court, into this hearing, and you see the situation we're talking about, and then you kind of cower at your, at your desk and you talk real low so the judge doesn't even really hear what you're saying and you act like you've already lost, well, I can assure you that the chances now have gone from 9 to 10 for you to the other way, for, the, uh, for your opponent. Not because you don't know the case inside out, not because you don't have the best case in the world from the perspective of the law, of the facts, and every other area, but because you're presenting this in a way where the judge really just isn't buying it. So it's not always about personality, but it's important to realize how your behavior and your ability to convey messages by the way you talk, the way you present yourself, and your body language can have a major impact on the results and the outcomes, we talked about outcomes earlier, the outcomes from your case, whether it's a summary judgment, motion to dismiss, whatever it is, uh, motion limiting, whatever. Uh, 
just it really depends on how you present yourself and but it's also extremely important when you're negotiating with an opponent I mean if and this would be true in law school if, if you have uh, some sort of an exercise with a classmate that you know the classmates sitting there cowering like this and says well, I don't, I don't, I don't, I didn't prepare for that. I didn't prepare for this. I don't know how to I don't know how to do this. I'm scared. I, I don't know what's going on. If that's the situation, well then, you know, you're probably going to react differently and handle things differently and that person is probably not going to have a great outcome. Uh, so you don't want to be that person. You want to be the person that no matter what the circumstances are, you're not going to display an arrogance, but you're going to be firmly grounded and confident. So this Amy Cuddy video is, is really important, and for years uh, I've shown this to students, and they have uh, some get it, and I don't know that many do, uh, because I don't think they really recognize the value of what Amy Cuddy talks about in terms of the impact on all of the areas that we've talked about. And you know, at the end of the day, uh, this class. If nothing else, you are going to get a, a very practical and realistic overview of these areas. But there's going to be some central themes that we're going to talk about. And at the end of it, I think most everything that we do, we talk about, and things like Amy Cuddy and all this, that is all going to come back kind of to the central theme of what we're doing. And what we're doing is what? What is it we're doing? We talked about this at the very beginning. We are trying to get the best absolute best outcome for our client that we possibly can. And the way we do that is by using the tools that we have at our disposal. But as with all tools, they require maintenance, they require, sometimes they have to be changed or upgraded. Uh, you cannot re ever rest on your laurels. And all the things we talk about are going to keep coming back to a basic theme that we're constantly improving ourselves for the purpose of improving the outcomes for our clients. And this is how this is going to happen. So uh, I will uh, share that link, and I think you'll find that to be a pretty interesting video, and we'll probably set up a, a bulletin board to uh, discuss that. So.